pleasant day to all. In this video presentation, we will highlight the different capital structure theories that financial managers or chief financial officers are using in determining the value of the company, and deciding on maximization of the company's capitalization. Previously, we have discussed the important concepts about capital structure and we have learned from that the capital structure, as it refers to the proportion of debt and equity representing the total capital of the business, which is required to fund the investments and day-to-day -day operational activities play a vital position to increase the firm value in the market. Today, as you will explore this video presentation, you will obtain another relevant chunk of financial management that will help you to become competitive in the field of managing financial aspects of the company. By the way, most of the time, you will encounter technical terminologies that are being used in financial management. So, I highly recommend that when you encounter technical terms, you can revisit our previous presentations, or study the terms right away so you can completely understand the topics that we are discussing. Let us begin the discussion with defining first the capital structure theory. Capital structure theory refers to a systematic approach to financing business activities through a combination of equities and liabilities. These theories are beneficial tool in terms of identifying the value of the firm and the overall costs of capital so that the financial management decision will be guided quantitatively. Meaning, the decision of the firm will be based on the computed value of the firm. These theories that we are about to discuss in this video presentation are important for the company to have a systematic approach in managing the capital of the organization. The capital structure theories consists of the following. Net income approach. Net operating income approach. Modigliani Miller approach. Let us discuss these theories one by one. The first theory is the net income theory. It was suggested by the David Durand. According to this approach, the capital structure decision is relevant to the valuation of the firm. In other words, a change in the capital structure leads to a corresponding change in the overall cost of capital as well as the total value of the firm. David Durand first suggested this approach in 1952, and he was a proponent of financial leverage. He hypothesized that a change in financial leverage results in a change in capital costs. In other words, if there's an increase in the debt ratio, capital structure increases, and the weighted average cost of capital, WACC, decreases, which results in higher firm value. According to this approach, the company should use more debt finance to reduce the overall cost of capital and increase the value of the firm. Net income approach is based on the following three important assumptions. There are no corporate tax. The cost debt is less than the cost of equity. And, the use of debt does not change the risk perception of the investors. Take note that these assumptions of net income approach will help you understand the concept very well. Now, let us move forward to calculation procedure. Take note that in calculating the value of the firm using net income approach, the presented procedure will definitely help you. For item letter A, EBIT or earning before interest and tax is given. The company income statement will provide you this information. Next item is the interest cost. For you to get this you will only multiply the company debt to the interest rate. Then for the item letter C which is the EAT or earning after tax, you will less the item letter B to item letter A. Take note as well that the net income approach assumes that there are no corporate tax. Shareholder earnings is equal to EAT or earning after tax. For item letter E which is the market value of equity shares, shareholders earning will be divided to cost of equity. Item letter F is given, it is well indicated in the financial report of the firm. Next, to get the total market volume of the firm, kindly add market value of the firm and the market value of debt. Lastly, for the item letter G or the overall cost of capital in percentage, earning before interest and tax will be divided to the computed total market value of the firm. Then multiply it to 100 to get the percentage. Let us use the presented procedure to get the overall cost of capital of the Champion Corporation considering that the company has the following financial information. EBIT or earning before interest and tax, 100,000. 
bonds, 300,000. Cost of bonds, 10%. And, cost of equity, 14%. Please take note that at the fourth column, I designated remarks to guide you where the figures or amount came from. Let us start with item A, earning before interest and tax is given, it is amounted to 100,000. For the item letter B, interest cost is 30,000. How did we got that? We have bonds amounting to 300,000 and its cost is 10%. So, the 10% of 300,000 is 30,000. For the next item, earning after tax is amounted to 70,000. Just deduct the computed interest cost to earning before interest and tax. Next, shareholder earning is equal to earning after tax, so, it is also 70,000. For item letter E, market value of equity share is amounted to 500,000. It was recognized through dividing the shareholder earnings by cost of equity which is 14%. Market value of debt is given. Next, to get the total market value of the firm, add the computed market value of equity share and the computed value of debt, which will give us the amount of 800,000. Lastly, item letter H or the overall cost of capital in percentage is 12.5%. It is earning before interest and tax divided by the total market value of the firm multiply by 100. Now, let's assume that the proportion of debt increases from 300,000 to 400,000 and everything else remains constant. This time, just focus on the affected particulars. Change the value from 300,000 to 400,000 and perform the same process as what we did earlier. So, with this particular illustration, the overall cost of capital in percentage is 12.07% lower than the computed overall cost of capital in percentage using 300,000 as the proportion of company's debt. So, to see the changes in the cost of capital of the company, let's take a look at the following comparison table. In the comparison table, the computed overall cost of capital of the company using the proportion of debt amounting to 300,000 is 12.5%. It is higher than the cost of capital when the company has a proportion of debt amounting to 400,000. Now, I want you to focus on the market value of the firm, the table clearly shows that from 800,000 going higher to 828,571.43. Take note that in the case of net income approach, with increase in debt proportion, the total market value of the company increases and cost of capital decreases. Now, let's move on the second theory which is the net operating income approach. Net operating income theory is the another approach suggested by David Duran. According to this approach, capital structure decision is irrelevant to the valuation of the firm. The market value of the firm is not at all affected by the capital structure changes. According to this approach, the change in capital structure will not lead to any change in the total value of the firm and market price of shares as well as the overall cost of capital. As per this approach, the WACC or weighted average cost of capital and the total value of a company are independent of the capital structure decision or financial leverage of a company. Like net income approach, the net operating approach also have an assumptions. These are the following. The overall cost of capital remains constant. There are no corporate taxes. And, the market capitalize the value of the firm as a whole. Now, let's see how to calculate the company's value using the net operating income approach. In this approach, we will see how the value of the firm and the cost of capital is being affected by the change in proportion of company's debt. To identify this, this presented calculation procedure will help you. For item letter A which is the earning before tax, like what we did on the net income approach, kindly check the given financial information because this item is given. For letter B which is the overall cost of capital, we will use the computed overall cost of capital using the net income approach. Next is the market value of the firm, to get this, just divide the item letter A by the item letter B, it is earning before interest and tax divided by overall cost of capital. For item letter D which is the total debt, 
the financial information of the company will provide you the figure. Next one is total equity, we will just simply subtract item C and item D or market value of the firm minus total debt. To get the shareholders earning, it is earning before interest and tax minus the percentage of total debt. Then finally, for item letter G which is the cost of equity, simply divide the shareholders earning by total equity. Now, let use this procedure to determine the value of the firm. Calculate the value of the Champion Corporation using net operating income approach with the help of the following financial information. Earning before interest and tax, 100,000. Bonds, 300,000. Cost of bonds, 10%. Overall cost of capital, 12.5%. Again, I indicated the fourth column as remark for you to be guided on how the following figures are computed. For items letter A and B which are the earning before interest and tax and overall cost of capital, you can get these from the given financial information. For you to get the 800,000 as the market value of the firm, simply divide the earning before interest and tax by the overall cost of capital or, item A divided by item B. The total debt of the company is given which is amounted to 300,000. Take note that bonds are company's debt obligation. Next is the total equity that is amounted to 500,000. Where this came from? That is market value of the firm minus total equity or, item C minus item D. For the next item which is the shareholders earning, the item A which is the EBIT will be subtracted from the 10% of total debt. That will give us the value of 70,000. Now, to compute the cost of equity, 70,000 as shareholder earnings divided by 500,000 as total equity. It will give us 14% cost of equity. This time, let us assume that the proportion of debt increases from 300,000 to 400,000 and everything else remains constant. I want you to focus on the item letter D, total debt, so from 300,000 we changed it to 400,000 based on the given assumption. Take note that the computation procedure is also the same, the only thing we did this time is that we change the proportion of debt as it increases from 300,000 to 400,000. But what we have right now is that we computed 15% cost of equity higher than the 14% cost of equity we computed using 300,000 as proportion of the company's debt. For you to clearly identify the changes, take a look at the following comparison table. I want you to focus on the market value of the firm and the cost of equity. As per the comparison table, we clearly observe that in the case of net operating income approach, with the increase in debt proportion, the total market value of the company remains unchanged, but the cost of equity increases. Now let's move on to the next approach which is the Modigliani-Miller approach. The MNM theorem or the Modigliani-Miller theorem was developed by economists Franco Modigliani and Merton Miller in 1958 and the main idea of this theory is that the capital structure of a company does not affect its overall value. This approach states that the financing decision of a firm does not affect the market value of a firm in a perfect capital market. In other words, MM approach maintains that the average cost of capital does not change, with change in the debt-weighted equity mix or capital structures of the firm. Let's see the different assumptions of this approach. The following are the major assumptions of Modigliani and Miller approach. There is a perfect capital market. There are no retained earnings. There are no corporate taxes. The investors act rationally. The dividend payout is 100%. And, the business consists of the same level of business risk. Take note that this approach is divided into two different propositions. The MM theorem on the perfect capital market. And, the MM theorem on the real world. In the MM theorem in perfectly efficient market, the assumption implies that companies operating in the world of perfectly efficient markets do not pay any taxes, the trading of securities is executed without any transaction costs, bankruptcy is possible but there are no bankruptcy costs, and information is perfectly proportioned. On the other hand, MM theorem in real world was developed to better suit real world conditions. 
the assumptions of the newer version imply that companies pay taxes, there are transaction, bankruptcy, and agency costs, and information is not balanced. However, there are also criticisms about M&M approach. This theory of capital structure was criticized because the assumption that capital markets are perfect is completely unrealistic. The arbitrage, as proof of the Modigliani-Miller theory, was also strongly criticized. If there are no perfect capital markets, the arbitrage will be useless because a levered and an unlevered firm within the same class of business risk will have different market values. The reasons why arbitrage does not allow market equilibrium in real life are as follows. Transaction costs. If there are transactions costs, buying stock will require bigger initial investments, but the return remains the same. Therefore, the market value of a levered firm will be higher than an unlevered one, assuming that both of them are within the same class of business risk. The cost of borrowing is not the same for individuals and firms. The cost of borrowing depends on the individual credit rating of the borrower. Institutional constraints. Institutional investors slow down arbitrage because they limit the use of financial leverage by their clients. Bankruptcy cost. The higher the financial leverage, the higher is the probability of bankruptcy. Therefore, bankruptcy costs have a strong influence on firms. Many critics of the Modigliani-Miller theory of capital structure believe that assumptions are unrealistic, and that the market value of a firm as well as WACC depends on financial leverage. Take note that all of the mentioned reasons have contributed to the criticisms of M&M approach. Please comment down what you have learned from the discussion today. This is the end of presentation, thank you very much and God bless everyone.